Topology is considered one of the coolest math fields out there. I mean, look at that. Topology even tells you how to invert a sphere in a smooth way. But did you know that there were eight discoveries that followed one another without which modern topology would not be possible? Okay, let's go back to the 17th century, to geometry and calculus, where the origins of the field are. That's real specific. Why not anything before that? A lot of the areas trace their origin back to the Greeks, so why not this one? Well, geometry has been studied since the time of the Greeks, most notably Euclid, for example. But in the 17th century, we saw a drastic transformation on how the subject is understood and applied. Before the 17th century, geometry was mostly finite shapes with static properties. I have to mention Euclid's elements, which was the foundation of our understanding. Geometry was about exact shapes like circles, triangles, and polygons, and their properties such as angles, lengths, and areas. Take a triangle, for example. Its properties are static. The lengths of its sides, the measure of its angles, the area contained within, and theorems like the Pythagorean theorem. These properties do not involve changing or moving the triangle, but are inherent and unchanging once the shape is defined, of course. But with the advancements of calculus, which was developed by figures like René Descartes, geometry began to incorporate the notion of coordinates equations defining curves and surfaces, and more importantly, the ability to handle transformations and motions. This period also saw the beginnings of projective geometry, which studies properties invariant under projections. Let me explain. Consider the curve of a function, say y equals x squared. Using calculus, we can study how this curve changes as x changes, analyze the slope at any point, the derivative, and find the area under the curve the integral. The focus shifted to understanding properties that could survive through continuous transformations, such as stretching or compressing the curve, without altering its fundamental nature, like being a parabola, for example. But we're still rather far from modern topology. I mean, of course, it would be impossible without Euclid's rigid geometry. But when was it that we started to see hints of topology emerging? If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. When Leonard Euler came into the picture, things changed, and it all started with his solution to the Königsberg Bridge problem in 1735. It's a famous mathematical puzzle set in the city of Königsberg. The city was separated by a river and included two islands, all of which were connected to each other by seven bridges. The challenge was to find a walking route that would cross each of the seven bridges once and only once returning to the starting point. If we take a look at the original map, it's not only hard to find a solution to the mathematical problem, it's also hard because you get distracted by all of these unnecessary details. Euler's approach to solving the bridge problem was the beginnings of graph theory. He simplified the map by representing the land using points or vertices, and bridges by using lines or edges. The Königsberg bridge problem was less about exact dimensions and more about the way things are connected. He ignored what is unnecessary and just kept what was essential. Euler's solution required thinking about the problem in topological terms, how elements are arranged and connected to each other, rather than their geometric specifics, like traditional metrics of distance and area. So in some cases, continuity is less relevant than connectivity and arrangement. Euler's solution represented a move toward abstract mathematics. How cool! But that's the solution to just one problem. When did this like underlying principle become relevant in general for other areas? With Johann Benedict Lissens' Vorstudien zur Topologie. Euler addressed a specific problem, but Johann Benedict Lissing took a more generalized and systematic approach. He saw that Euler's approach was not unique to the Königsberg problem, it could be generalized because of its underlying principles. Lissing's work was one of the first works that treated topology as a distinct area of mathematics. Lissing was the one who coined the term topology and began to formalize the study of properties preserved through continuous deformations such as banding and stretching. But how was he able to generalize that? What I mean is, 
what exactly were the underlying problems that could connect all of them? Lissing wanted to provide this framework by identifying and studying some properties that are invariant under continuous transformations. In other words, he wanted to create a new area of mathematics that would focus on studying properties of shapes and spaces that do not change even when the shapes are stretched, bent, or squished. He was interested in finding out what remains the same about an object, no matter how much you transform it, as long as you don't cut it or glue parts of it together. And this idea is at the core of what we now call topology. Give me an example. The Mobius strip is a really great one. I mean, yeah, it was discovered after listening, but it gives you a grasp of the thought process behind his idea. So take a long strip of paper, give it a half twist, and then we tape the ends together. And this creates a surface with one side and one edge. If you draw a line down the center of the mobile strip, and then you end up back where you started, having drawn on both sides of the original strip. This shows a property that remains unchanged under deformation. The strip wants sidedness. It doesn't matter how much you stretch or twist the mobile strip. As long as you don't tear it or cut it, it always has just one side. We're getting closer and closer to modern topology. Now, when was it that mathematicians started to play with extra dimensions? That came with Riemann's idea of a manifold. Riemann took these ideas further by introducing the concept of a manifold, which allowed mathematicians to think about spaces that might be curved, or even have higher dimensions than the standard three-dimensional space we're used to. A Riemannian manifold is essentially space that looks flat at very small scales, but can have curvature when viewed more broadly. If you imagine standing on the surface of the Earth, locally, right around your feet, the surface seems flat, which is why we can use flat maps for local navigation. However, as you consider larger areas, you have to account for the curvature of the Earth. The surface of a sphere is a two-dimensional space. This means any point on the surface can be described to using just two coordinates, like latitude and longitude, despite the sphere existing in three-dimensional space. In Riemannian geometry, a metric defines how distances are measured. On the sphere, distances are not measured straight through the interior, as you would in Euclidean space, but along the curved surface. The shortest path between any two points on a sphere, like on Earth, is along a great circle route. And when was it that we had like one shape merging into another? When did this start happening? You know, like when two shapes that look nothing alike can mm -hmm. be merged one into the other? Well, Riemann focused on studying these manifolds mainly by studying their local geometric properties. This means that he was interested in knowing what the space looks like in small and local areas, how it curves, bends, and what its angles are like at any small part of the manifold. For example, if you were examining the surface of an orange peel, Riemann's methods would involve looking closely at small patches of the peel to see how they curve around the inner orange. But in 1895, Henry Poincaré took these ideas further. He wanted to understand space from a global perspective. This means looking at the entire shape and structure of a space, not just little pieces of it. He was interested in properties that describe the space as a whole, like how many holes it has, whether it has boundaries, and how it is connected. Thus, Poincaré developed algebraic topology. This field used algebra to study topological spaces, focusing on properties that don't change even when the space is bent or stretched. For example, no matter how much you stretch or compress a coffee cup, it still has one hole where the handle is. Just like a donut has one hole in its center, the two are homeomorphic. A homeomorphism is a continuous deformation between two topological spaces that can be reversed by another continuous deformation. Essentially, two spaces are homeomorphic, if one can be transformed into the other without cutting or gluing parts of the spaces. It's a precise way to say that two shapes are essentially the same from the topological viewpoint. Poincaré used this concept to develop tools like the fundamental group and homology groups, which mathematically capture these invariant properties. We finally got into topology. 
Tell me, what was missing from Poincaré's analysis to get to general topology? There was a need to define and handle the more fundamental aspects of topology. The work of mathematicians like Felix Halsdorff, who formalized many of the ideas that Poincaré's work implied, but did not explicitly define, was instrumental. An open set in topological space is a set where, for every point in the set, there is an open neighborhood around that point, which is also entirely contained within the set. For example, in the case of the real numbers, with standard topology, an open interval like AB, which includes all numbers between A and B, but not A and B themselves, is an open set. A closed set is one that contains all its limit points as well. In R, the interval AB is closed because it includes all points between A and B, including A and B themselves. And these concepts define the topology of a space. A function is continuous if the pre-image inverse image of every open set is open. This aligns with the intuitive idea that small changes in the input result in small changes in the output. For example, a function f from r to r, defined by f of x equals x squared, is continuous on r because for any open interval around f of x, there is an open interval around x such that f maps it entirely into the first interval. In topology, convergence is generalized beyond the usual numerical limits. A sequence of points in a topological space is said to converge to a point if, for every open set containing the limit point, there is a point in the sequence beyond which all points of the sequence lie in that open set. For instance, in R, the sequence 1 over n converges to 0, because for any open interval around 0, no matter how small it is, eventually all the elements of the sequence will lie within that interval. He also developed the concept of Hausdorff spaces. Consider the space R with the usual topology. For any two distinct points, x and y, you can always find two open intervals, one around each point, that do not overlap. This property is crucial for many areas of analysis and geometry, as it provides a strong form of control over how sequences behave and how functions can be studied. And is there more to it? How did we get to modern topology? General topology deals with the broad properties of a space, like compactness, connectedness, and continuity. Mathematicians start to explore specific types of topological objects and spaces. It expanded into other areas like knot theory, low-dimensional topology, sheaf theory, topological data analysis, just to name a few. Knot theory and low-dimensional topology focus on how spaces, particularly curves and surfaces, behave in low-dimensional settings, such as three-dimensional space and four-dimensional spacetime. A knot is a looped piece of string in three-dimensional space that can be twisted and tangled but not broken. As topology matured, its applications in fields like molecular biology, for example, with DNA knotting, chemistry and physics, particularly in the study of the topology of the universe and the properties of space-time, required more detailed studies of how spaces are intertwined and connected. This led to the development of theories specific to knots, to links and embedded surfaces. Random question to you about another field. How did we get to linear algebra? Was linear algebra formed the same way? Oh yes, check out this video right here to see how. <laughs> 